Okay, welcome to Word Without Walls. Welcome to the Tuesday night sunlight service again this week. This is Heart Issues Part 3. And whenever I think about the heart, it usually gets me to thinking about the blood. Because that's what the heart does, it pumps blood. So, in, in our case, you know, the heart being again the mind of Christ, the heart being that from which the issues of life flow, the heart being our innermost being, the, the, the Jesus inside of us, God in the flesh, love in a body, when we're thinking about the blood flow, we're thinking about the love flow. And that's why uh, one of my verses for today is Leviticus chapter 17, verse 11, and the beginning of the verse says, For the life of the flesh is in the blood. Which again, when you understand that, to live is to love, and to love is to live. If the life of the flesh is in the blood, that means the love of the flesh, or, or again, of us, is in the blood. But really tonight, uh, I really want to make kind of a very big distinction between the way things were and the way things are. And uh, kind of as a personal story, I have a, I have a tattoo of Joker from the Batman on my wrist. And when I met a... Uh, he was a teacher, actually, at the Bible college I went to. When I first met him, he looked at my tattoo and he said, Oh, did you get that B.C.? And for a minute I was like, what do you, what do you mean? And he was like, you got that before Christ, right? Because it's not a, you know, it's not a religious tattoo, it's not a cross or, or whatever. And uh, I just kind of chuckled and, you know, went with it because, in fact, I hadn't got it before Christ. But that's how a lot of people, especially religious folk, that's how a lot of people look at things. There's before Christ and there's after Christ. Because I guess, you know, a lot of people sometimes they have that, they have that Saul of Tarsus getting knocked off his donkey and being blinded by the light and everything changes moment. They have that whole life before and then they have that experience and then they have that whole life after. And that's not for everybody, but I think that's, that's I think a lot of people can relate to that kind of experience. But really, the before and the after is before the cross and after the cross. There's a way things were, and there's a way things are now. And I agree that, you know, we have to have that, that personal experience, and, and in large part, I think it takes place in the waters of baptism, where we enter into a relationship with Jesus, we enter into a covenant with Jesus, when, when we really start to almost kind of take this thing seriously, as it were. But... For tonight, we're going to focus on how things were and how things are now. And we're looking at it through this idea of the life of the flesh being in the blood. Because there's a story in Luke chapter 8, and I only want to read two verses of it, but it's about, uh, well, I'll just read it. Luke chapter 8, verses 43 and 44. In the King James Bible, it reads like this. And a woman, having an issue of blood twelve years, which had spent all her living upon physicians, neither could be healed of any, came behind him, him being Jesus, and touched the border of his garment, and immediately her issue of blood stanched. Now here's the deal. We are the woman, right? We are the bride of Christ, or, or now, again, on this side of the cross, we are the Lamb's wife. We are the woman. The woman represents the church. The woman represents us. And we had an issue of blood. And the, and the problem was, the blood was flowing, and it was flowing, and it was flowing, and we couldn't get it to stop. We were, we were literally working ourselves to death, trying to be somebody that we weren't. And, and, and again, going to all these different doctors, all these different remedies, all these different self-help books, all these different whatever it is, to try to fix this problem. Knowing it's a problem, but absolutely unable to do anything about the problem, because the blood won't stop flowing. The, our, our heart was bleeding love, but it just, like it was slipping away. It was, it's like we were trying to get something, but instead we were losing what we had to try to get it. We were trying to earn something that can't be earned. And again it says, uh, She came behind him and touched the border of his garment, and immediately her issue of blood stanched. The experience with Jesus made the blood stop flowing. It made our efforts, and, and, and I think it's in the book of Hebrews, it talks about having our conscience seared with a hot iron, and, and, and that cauterizes it, and that stops the wound, as it were. It stops the blood from flowing. 
It stops us from emptying ourselves in order to try to get something because an experience with Jesus shows us that we already have something. So again, there's the way things were before the cross where we were giving it everything we got. Jesus said, up until John the Baptist, the kingdom of God suffers violence and the violent take it by force. We were trying so hard to be somebody that we weren't, trying so hard to get something that we knew we needed. We knew we had a problem. We knew we had an issue. And again, before the cross, our heart issue was, was the blood was flowing, but, but it was leaking out. It was, it was coming out. We, were, it, we couldn't stop it. We couldn't keep the blood circulating, as it were, because it was all flowing out. We had a problem, but we couldn't do anything about it. And no matter how hard we tried, all we got when we banged our head against the wall was a headache. Enter Jesus, and, and, and immediately the blood was staunched. Immediately, the problem that he had wasn't a problem anymore. He stopped it. He came to do what we couldn't do. We tried so hard to fulfill the law. We tried so hard to be this idea of what we thought holy was, or this idea of what we thought God wanted us to be. We tried so hard to fit into this box, and Jesus came and he said, You don't need to fit into a box. Let me show you who my Father is. Let me show you who you really are. Let me stop you from all this work that you can't accomplish anyway. Let me finish the work. Let me fulfill the law. Let me be everything to you, in you, through you, and as you. Let me be lifted up from the earth and I'll draw you into myself. I'll plant myself in you. I'll stop this blood from flowing. And then we get to Mark chapter 14 verse 24. And it takes it even to the next level. Uh, Mark 14, 24, and the King James reads like this. And he, Jesus, said unto them, this is, this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many. So do you see how our blood was, well, we couldn't stop it. It was, it was getting away, it was leaking away. Our blood was flowing. We had an issue with blood. And, 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 then, and then we had an encounter with Jesus, and immediately, the blood stopped, and then Jesus said, now, now this is my blood, and I'm going to shed my blood for you. You were shedding your blood for yourself, trying to get whatever you could get, and that wasn't working. And even when you were doing that, you were trying to be healed of that. You knew it wasn't right. You knew it wasn't working. You tried everything and everybody to get rid of this issue. And then you came to me, and I stopped it. And not only did I stop your blood from flowing, but I let my blood flow. It's the same picture we see when, way back in the Garden of Eden, when God told Adam, you'll have to uh, earn your bread by the sweat of your brow. And then we fast forward to the Garden of Gethsemane, and Jesus is, is, is sweating great drops of blood. He redeemed us through his blood. He, he used his blood as a trump card, and he said, I don't want your blood. I don't want your sweat. I don't want your tears. I don't want your effort. I'm, I, I don't want anything from you. I want everything for you. God wanted the best for us, so he gave the best to us. He gave us his only begotten son. Jesus gave us his blood because our blood wasn't getting it done. Our blood, sweat, and tears, as hard as we tried, as much as we tried to grab that carrot, every time the stick kept moving. Jesus told the rich young ruler, do this, this, and this, and, and, and he said, I've done that. And Jesus said, there's still one thing you lack. And under religion, there's always one thing that you lack. Under the law, the Bible says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We tried the best we could with what we had, but we didn't know what we had. We thought we didn't have anything. So we were always trying to get, get, get. And here's the problem with that. Love is not about getting. Love is giving. Okay? God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son. You don't love in order to get. You love because you have something to give. And that's what happened when Jesus stopped our blood from flowing and let his blood flow. He gave us something that we could give. He filled us up to overflowing with something so that we could share it with each other, so that we could give to each other what we all needed in the first place, what we all had in the first place, but didn't know we had because we didn't have the Holy Spirit, our love receptor. And, and again, what we see here, Jesus said, this is my blood of the New Testament. There's a way things were, there's an Old Testament, which cried out for our blood. Remember, uh, uh, I don't. In the old covenant, in the Old Testament, it talks about 
you know, the, the ground crying out for the innocent blood of Abel. Okay, so, so in the Old Covenant, it was all about our blood. It was all about, you know, an eye for an eye. It was all about you get what you deserve. And then we come to a New Testament, a New Covenant, which, which is Jesus' blood, which He shed for us. And He did it willingly. We did it because that's all we could think of to do. I mean, even there, one of my favorite stories in the Old Testament is uh, Elijah the prophet. When, when all the other prophets of all the other gods, I, I think they got a Baal, Elijah's the only prophet of God left, and they're all talking about how great their God is, and he says, well, let's, let's make two offerings, and we'll see which one gets the job done. So, so all the other prophets, they're like, they, they, they set up their, their offering, and nothing happens. So they start dancing around, and nothing happens. So they start cutting themselves, and they start literally shedding their own blood just to try to move God, just to try to make something happen, and nothing happens. And then Elijah says, God, show yourself. And he does. Because there's, there, again, there's the way we think it should be. There's the way that it was and, there was. and then there's a more excellent way. There's the way God thinks it should be. There's the way that it is. He doesn't want us to shed our blood. He shed his blood for us. He stopped our issue of blood. And he made it all about his blood. Because the life of the flesh is in the blood. Okay, so, so really, when, when, in a sense, when we got a heart transplant, when, when, the, when the circumcision of the heart took place, when the flesh of human effort was cut away and God's heart was revealed in our chests, in a sense, we also got a blood transfusion. In a sense, it wasn't us shedding our blood anymore to try to make something happen. It was Jesus shedding his blood to finish what needed to happen. And now, the life that's in this flesh... It's not an Adam life, it's not a, not a human life as we think of it, but it's a God life. It's Jesus' life flowing through our veins. It's His DNA, divine nature of the Almighty. It's, it's literally Jesus, God in the flesh, love in a body, in our flesh, in our body. Remember when Paul wrote about, he said, I am crucified with Christ, and while I've died, yet I live, but not me, but Christ lives in me. And this life I live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. He doesn't want our blood, sweat, and tears. He wants our faith. And He gave us the measure of faith. He gave us the ability to have faith in Him by proving Himself faithful. He let us believe by giving us something to believe in. Jesus said the greatest love a man can have is to lay down his life for his friends. And then He went to the cross and did that very thing. He proved it to us. He proved His love for us. In that we were, when we were yet sinners, He died for us. He didn't die for us when we could do anything for Him. He died for us so that He could do everything for us. He stopped our blood from flowing and He let His blood flow. So now let's go to 2 Timothy 2.22. 2 Timothy 2.22, in the King James it reads, Flee also youthful lusts, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, which means love, peace, with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. So once again, we see it's a heart issue. It's all about the heart and what flows from the heart. I, I, uh, I didn't write down the verse, I didn't search out the verse, but I think it's in the book of Genesis, way back, way back in the very beginning, God saw the wickedness of man's heart. He saw the only thing that comes out of man's heart is wickedness. Man is self-centered, self-serving. Man's all about himself. And then I think it's, we get to the book of Ezekiel, and, and, and there's a promise from God where he says, I will give you one new heart, because it's his heart. He knew we needed a heart change because he knew we had a heart issue. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Everything we are and everything we do flows from our heart. So when we have the this 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 uh, it says youthful lusts in Second Timothy, when we have this uh, this this worldview, as it were, of of how things are supposed to be and what we're supposed to want and how we're supposed to get those things, that's all kind of childish stuff, and and, and you know. We all have to go through that, but as always, there's a more excellent way. And, and when, that, when that encounter with Jesus, that experience with Jesus comes, 
when that blood stops flowing and his blood starts flowing, then we can follow these things out of a pure heart. We can follow righteousness, faith, love, peace out of a pure heart because that's what flows out of a pure heart. So again, it's not about what you do, it's about what you believe because what you do flows from what you believe. Remember Jesus said, where your treasure is, that's where your heart will be. The things that are important to you, that's where your focus is, that's where your energy is, that's where you spend your three T's, your time, your talent, and your treasure. So that's where you put, that's what you put your heart into, that's what you put your heart and soul into, that's what you put your blood, sweat, and tears into. And, 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 and you know, in another place it says, those who are led by the Spirit, those are the sons of God. If we're following something out of a pure heart, what are we following? The Holy Spirit, the, the Spirit of truth that leads and guides us into all truth. All truth being, the Father loveth the Son and has given all things into His hands. This pure heart inside of us leads us and guides us and allows us to follow righteousness, faith, love, and peace. Because that's what this pure heart is. If it's inside you and you know it's inside you and you believe it's inside you, then it comes out of you naturally. Right? Because you can't give what you don't have. And you can only give what you do have. How could you follow these things unless you had something inside of you to lead you to these things? The Holy Spirit, the love receptor. Because remember, the way things were and the way things are, throughout all of it, God has loved us. He always has and He always will. That's who He is. The Holy Spirit, the cross, did not change us into something that all of a sudden God could finally love us. He already loved us and He always had and He always will. What the cross did by giving us the Holy Spirit is it changed us into somebody who could receive His love, somebody who could believe His love, somebody who could stop looking for love in all the wrong places, somebody who could stop shedding their blood to try to get God to love them and instead could just know that He's there and just call on Him. So I want to finish in Romans chapter 6. And I feel like I reach for this verse a lot, but I want to actually, I want to quote it and I want to dig into it a little bit. Uh, Romans chapter 6, starting with verse 19, in the King James it reads like this, I speak after the manner of men, so, so right from the jump we need to know what we're talking about here. If Paul is speaking from the manner of men, he, he's getting on the level with, with how things were, okay? He's speaking on the love, in the, after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. So when we see the flesh here, when, when, when we're talking about the life of the flesh being in the blood, he's kind of talking about those under the old covenant, those under the law, those who are, who are still coming from that place of, of being self-centered, of being, uh, you know, uh, even religious, man-centered, performance-based religious. He's talking about the infirmity of our flesh. For as ye have yielded your members, servants, to uncleanness and to iniquity unto iniquity, even so now yield your members, servants, to righteousness unto holiness. Those are the way things were. Those are the way things are now. We used to be slaves to sin, right? Sin is bondage. We were dead in our trespasses and sins. And then on the cross, Jesus gave us his life, and now we are no longer dead, but we are experiencing His life. We are partakers of His divine nature. We have this abundant, everlasting, eternal resurrection life. We were dead before the cross. We are alive now because of the cross. And again, what's the difference between life and death? We know that we have passed from death unto life because we love each other. Love is literally the difference between life and death. For the life of the flesh is in the blood, the love of the flesh is in the blood. There's a way things were, there's a way things are. And it says in verse 20, For when ye were the servants of sin, ye were free from righteousness. And this is the verse that I really wanted to key on. What fruit had ye then in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? For the end of those things is life. And here's the deal, we've all done things that we're ashamed of. We've all done things that, we're, that we wish we hadn't done. And, and, and again, the end of those things is death. The wages of sin is death. 
not believing that God loves you, forces you to look for love in all the wrong places. Because one of the absolute truths about being a human being is a desire, a craving, a need for love. And unless you believe that you are loved, you're going to do whatever you think you need to do to get that. And, and, and that's where some of those shameful things come from. That's why people get stuck sometimes in the things they get stuck in. Because it makes them feel different. It makes them feel uh, like they've got something. But, again, the end of those things is death. And that's where we were before the cross. We were dead in our trespasses and sins. We were trying so hard to earn something that can't be earned. We were trying so hard to get something that we already had. The problem wasn't getting it. The problem was we didn't know we had it. The problem was it was dark and we couldn't see clearly. We couldn't see who God was and we couldn't see who we were. And that's why Jesus, the light of the world, came to earth in the same flesh that we have. And he said, I'll show you the Father. And then he loved people as hard as he could. He said, I'll show you the Father, and he healed people. He said, I'll show you the Father, and he stopped our issue of blood. He said, I'll show you the Father, and he gave his blood. He said, I'll show you the Father, and he went to the cross, and he died for us and as us, so that we could live for him and as him. He finished the work that we were trying to do, but couldn't come anywhere close to doing. He conformed us to his image. Really, literally, just by showing us His image. By opening our spiritual eyes. By saying, this is who God is. It's, it's you and me. It's what's inside of us. It's that pure heart. It's the inner man that is strengthened by the Holy Spirit. So it says, What fruit had ye then in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. There's no fruit in that stuff. There's nothing good to eat there. But now, being made free from sin, and become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness, and the end, everlasting life. See, once again, there's a way that seems right to a man, but the end of that way is death. We were trying as hard as we could, and doing the best we could with what we had. But we didn't know that we had anything. We thought, I don't have anything, but I need something. So I'm going to go get it. I'm going to give my blood, sweat, and tears. While, again, at the same time, even while we're giving our blood, sweat, and tears, even while we're trying and trying and trying, we know it's not right. We know it's not working. We know all we're doing is killing ourselves. Right? There's a line in a movie that says, if you work for a living, why do you kill yourself working? Right? That doesn't seem right. And we knew that. The, the, the woman with the issue of blood, she knew that it wasn't right. She went everywhere she could go and tried everything she could do to stop that blood from flowing, even while she was the one shedding it to try to get what she wanted. And the only thing that could stop that blood from flowing was an encounter with Jesus. He is the solution. He is the answer to the problem. And then he took it a step further, and not only did he stop our blood from flowing, but he shed his blood. Not only did he say, I don't want your blood, sweat, and tears, I'm going to give you mine. I'm going to sweat great drops of blood. I'm going to redeem you from the curse that you were under. I'm going to put things right. I'm going to get you out of bondage and get you into freedom. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Liberty from sin, liberty to love. It says, but now being made free from sin and become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The gift of God is eternal life. You can't earn a gift. If you have to earn it, it's not a gift. Gifts are freely given, but they must be received. And again, that's what the new commandment for the new man in the New Testament or the new covenant, that's what it is. Love one another as I have loved you. That's what Jesus said. Receive my love and then give it out to everyone you come into contact with. Don't love in order to be loved. Love because you are loved. All right. Take, receive this gift and share it. That's why we're here. That's our whole entire purpose, is to receive God's love for us and to share it with those around us. And Jesus said in another place, He said, Eternal life is knowing the Father and the one 
who he sent. Eternal life, which is the gift of God, is an unconditional love relationship between Father and Son. Almost every time God spoke specifically to Jesus or, or, or about Jesus, he said, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. You are my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Every time he had, the Father addressed his Son, he, he, he made it absolutely known. You're not just my Son, you're my beloved Son. You, have, you are the object of my love. You are the apple of my eye. You're my favorite. And since, you know, as he is, so are we in this world, that means I'm his favorite. And that means you're his favorite. That means you're the apple of his eye. I'm the apple of his eye. He looks at us just the same way he looks at Jesus because that's who we are. That's who lives inside of us. And that's who we live inside of. So again, when, when, when we're talking about the life of the flesh being in the blood, it's a new blood. So it's a new life. It's not just life as we knew it. It's everlasting life. It's abundant life. And the thing that makes abundant life abundant is love. The difference between life and death is love. If you dwell in love, you have life. If you don't love, you dwell in death. So let me read this in the Message Bible and then I'm going to close. It says, Romans chapter 6, starting with verse 19, and the Message Bible reads like this. I'm using this freedom language because it's easy to picture. You can readily recall, can't you, how at one time, the more you did just what you felt like doing, not caring about others, not caring about God, the worse your life became and the less freedom you had? And how much different is it now as you live in God's freedom? Your lives healed and expansive in holiness. I think that's awesome that we made a mess of it, and then he said, it's okay, I'm going to clean it up for you. I'm going to take care of it. It's like, it's like the picture of, again, remember youthful lusts? It's like a picture of, uh, of a baby who poops in his diaper. That baby has no ability to clean himself up. But mom or dad, loving parent, comes by and says, I'll clean you up. I'll take care of you. You can't do this, so I'll do it for you. It says, as long as you did what you felt like doing, ignoring God, you didn't have to bother with right thinking or right living or right anything for that matter. But do you call that a free life? What did you get out of it? Nothing you're proud of now. Where did it get you? A dead end. But now that you've found you don't have to listen to sin tell you what to do and have discovered the delight of listening to God telling you, what a surprise. A whole, healed, put-together life right now, with more and more of life on the way. Work hard for sin your whole life, and your pension is death. But God's gift is real life, eternal life, delivered by Jesus, our Master. Once again, how did, how did Jesus deliver that life? He shed His blood for us. He gave His blood to us. He drew us into Him, and He planted Himself in us. He cut away the flesh of our heart. He circumcised our heart to reveal that it wasn't our heart at all. It was God's heart beating in our chest. It, we just had to dig down a little bit deeper. That's why the deep calls out to the deep, because love calls out to love. That's why it's so important that we understand that the life or the love of the flesh is in the blood. His blood pumping from His heart in our chest, that's how He delivered His life to us. Not the life that we had, but the life that He wanted for us. Not all the mistakes that we made, but His mercy and grace and righteousness and peace and love. That's what He gave us. That was His gift. That's where we are now through the blood of Christ, because of the blood of Christ. That's why when we talk about heart issues for the last three weeks, and, and, and at least for the next couple, I haven't really been focusing on all the bad heart issues that you can have. I've been focusing on the good heart issues. And to me, really, the only issue the heart is concerned with is love. And that's why we talked about blood, because the heart pumps the blood, the heart pumps the love through our whole bodies. And we are all one body. We're all connected. It flows out of me into you, through you into somebody else. That's what this thing is all about. That's what this abundant 
eternal, everlasting, resurrection life is all about. It's about, I know my Heavenly Father loves me, and because of that I can love you. And because of that you can love whoever you come into contact with, and on and on and on. Because it's all about love. Jesus said, I have come that they, have my, that they might have life. He didn't say, I have come that they might have religion. He didn't say, I have come that they might fight each other about what they believe. He said, I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. And the life is in the blood. So that's what I have for this week. As always, thank you so much for all your support, all uh, the attendance, helping, uh, just helping me get the word out there with the rants and the videos and the books. I just thank you. I appreciate you. I love you. And there's nothing you can do about it. Amen.